Hey there and welcome to Finishing Strong. We plan to finish strong today. This is part four of our four parts together. We are opening the Bible and we're finding out what it means to finish strong and to finish strong with Jesus. We will have a good time. We are going to have questions and answers in just a moment. You are going to be blessed by wonderful music. We'll open the Bible and see if God will speak to us. I believe that He would. And I'm glad that you're here from wherever you are. We have people joining us from all across the United States and from other countries as well. What fun to be together and focus on finishing strong. Let's begin with your questions and my answers. We'll ask God to guide us. I'm going to invite my wife, Melissa Bradshaw, who is from It Is Written's children's ministry, My Place With Jesus. And I know that you got some special things to share with us today. Thanks for being here. It's oh, nice it's to, to see you. Here. Good to see you. Hey, you talked about this uh, first day we got I together did. for Finishing Strong. I want to ask you about it again now. What, what more can you tell us about Flight 316, which is a brand new vacation Bible school, which you wrote yes. and has been really beautifully put together by our creative team at It Is Written. Five days where young people travel the world to get stamps and their passports that we provide for them. And they go to the South Pacific and to Asia and South America and to Europe and to Africa. So what else can you share with us about um, Flight 316, this cool new Vacation Bible School? Well, Flight 316 is going to be so fun. You mentioned we have the passports. You're yes. going to get stamps in and also in the opening and closing, there are some in-flight videos oh, cool. that kind of tell you about the places that you're going to visit. Nice. So that's really fun. Okay. And then we have some Bible quizzes that are really fun as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. So, Tell me something about the music, because I know that you wrote lots of scripture songs and some of those are used in Flight 316, correct? That's right. We have some scripture songs. Every day you're going to learn, or the children attending Flight 316 will learn a scripture song every day. Yeah. Uh, you have a memory verse, it's easy to put it together with song and you'll remember it forever. Yeah, great way to remember the Bible, right? It is. And they're fun songs that you never forget. I remember doing Flight 316 and on Sabbath, the pastor was singing the yes, songs yes. from Flight 316. It, these are songs that will stick and yeah. you'll never forget. I thought that was pretty nice. So if you're looking for a VBS, you want to be part of a VBS or your church wants to do a vacation Bible school, we hope you'll think about Flight 316 because it's really good. Okay. You've got some questions. I'm going to put this down because it's obscuring you just All a little bit. All right. Yes, we have some questions and I'm going to read the first question. All right. From Christian Molina, a first grader okay. from Co Tacoma Academy Preparatory School yes. in Tacoma Park, Maryland. My question is, who is God's dad? What a good question. And I'm here to be able to tell you that God has no dad. God has existed from eternity. Isn't that a mystery? Hmm. Now, Christian, as a first grader, you're probably saying, well, I don't understand that. Well, I'm not a first grader. I was a first grader once, believe it or not. And even I say, well, that's a real mystery. But that's because we're talking about God who is so far above us. God has always existed. He didn't have a beginning, so he didn't have a dad. This is what makes him God. If God had a beginning, then who was there to help God have his beginning? That person must have been God. When we get to heaven, Christian, we'll be able to ask God to explain this to us, and He will. Very good. And our second question, Hope from Hope Caesar, a third grader from Gethsemane Christian Junior Academy in Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay. My question is, why is there suffering in the Bible? Hope, this is a question that I could take quite a long time to answer. I won't because, I mean, I could talk all day about this. It's a, it's a really important question. Why is there suffering in the Bible? Well, that's because there's sin in the world. We had a question earlier in Finishing Strong where someone asked about why there's sin in the world, and that's because God gave us freedom of choice. It's not God's fault. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and, and sinfulness was passed down from Adam and Eve to us today. There's, let me get the question correct. Can I just see the wording? I don't want to misrepresent what Hope asked me. Yeah. And so there's suffering in the Bible because the Bible accurately traces what was going on in the world during Bible times. That suffering exists because of sin and because of people who are not connected to God. Now, now, if by suffering you mean illness, 
that's a result of sin and we are weakened and our bodies aren't so strong and our immune systems aren't as strong as they once were. And now there's all kinds of terrible diseases in the world that came as a result of sin. Uh, but if you mean suffering, why people are mean to each other and unkind to each other, why there were wars, well, that's because there's sin and sinful people do mean things when they're not guided by the Holy Spirit. Here's the good news. We're going to a land where there's no suffering. One day soon, we'll be with Jesus. There'll be no death, no sadness, no pain. No one will shed any tears. It'll only be good. Sin has brought the suffering in the world. So we want to stay away from sin and we want to stay close to Jesus and let Jesus' will be done in our lives. Good question, thank you. Gabrielle Frederick is a first grader from Little Rock Adventist Academy in Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay. My question is, how, how did Jesus walk on water? Oh, great question. Okay, if you're gonna ask me that, then I'm gonna ask you some questions, all right? Here we go, first one. How did the walls of Jericho fall down? Hmm. How did the manna get hmm. on the ground when the children of Israel were walking through the wilderness, wandering in the wilderness, living in the wilderness? How did water gush out of a rock when they were in the wilderness? How were the blind miraculously able to see or the people who were paralyzed miraculously able to walk? How was it that they went down to catch a fish and the fish had a gold coin in its mouth? Out of that one, oh, how cool. that happened? <laughs> yeah. There's one answer for all of those uh, questions, and that is, it was a miracle. Jesus is the creator. He made the water, and he can walk on it if he wants to. No, it wasn't ice. No, there weren't rocks underneath the water. It was water, okay, but Jesus is God, and God is the miracle worker, and we need to understand that there is nothing too hard for God. Come on, let's think of some other miracles. An axe head floated way back in Old Testament times. That's Can you heavy. think of another one? Um, That's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, axe heads are typically heavy. What's another? Uh, people raised to life. Raised to life, like Lazarus was raised and from the dead. The, the woman of Nain's son. Yes, yes, yes. Um, let me think about it. It's my turn to think of a miracle in the Bible. Um, oh, in the time of Jonah, that plant grew up really quickly and covered him and provided him with shade. That was a miracle. Oh, well, the miracle was that uh, no, uh, Jonah could survive in the belly of a whale. Yeah, for three days or so. Yes, that's right. And so there's lots and lots of miracles that happen in the Bible, and they happen because God is a miracle working God. You can have faith in God and you can trust God. Our last question is from Moses Dukuzamana. He's a first grader at Little Rock Adventist Academy in Little Rock, Arkansas. How did Mary get demons? Oh, yeah. Wow, that's a pretty good question. It is. It was because of sin. She opened her life up to Satan, and Satan came in, and they came a little more, and came a little more, and came a little more. Eventually, the demons possessed her. Now, got to be careful. That does not mean everybody who sins is going to be possessed by the devil. No, no, no. But she surrendered her life more and more to the devil so that he was able to take a, make a foothold into a stronghold. Mm. And he governed her life and, and filled her up with his presence. Now, here's what we do to guard against that. We invite Jesus into our lives and fill our lives up with the presence of God. Mm -hmm. That's what you want to do. Um, but she ended up being demon-possessed because choosing not to disobey, uh, choosing not to obey God, she ended up in a sinful lifestyle and she got more and more and more and more sinful and the devil could take more and more and more and more of her life and her mind and her heart until he just took over and the demons moved in. So if you stay close to Jesus, if we stay close to Jesus, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we can be filled with Jesus and guided by holy angels not filled with the presence of demons and unholy angels. Mm -hmm. Great questions. We're gonna be back with more in just a moment. Thank you for your questions. We really appreciate them. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and by night. Exodus 
I am so glad you are part of Finishing Strong. We have young people joining us from here, there, and everywhere for the purpose of opening up the Bible so that we can finish strong. And what is the finish line anyway? What is the finish line? If you watch athletes, well, they run to the finish, and in some races, there's a, a tape of some kind across the finish line. That's where they finish. In other races, there's a kind of a camera there taking a photo to see who crossed first in case they're really close. The finish line, we understand that. Uh, in a motor race, there's somebody who stands at the end with a checkered flag, and that person waves the flag as the cars go roaring by. What's the finish line for the believer in Jesus? Well, here's what Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. He wrote, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I have got some really good news for you. Jesus is coming back soon. And He wants us to be ready for that day. And He wants us to finish strong. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back? Well, on the other side of Jesus coming back, the earth is going to be recreated. It will be more perfect than you could even imagine. After Jesus comes back, we go to heaven for a thousand years. Wow, won't that be wonderful? We'll be able to walk on streets of gold alongside the river of life. We'll be able to eat the fruit that grows on the tree of life, and it will be splendid. In the new earth, there's no question. There'll be animals of all different kinds. I wonder if there'll be animals we've never seen before, maybe like extinct animals. You know, in Madagascar, they had a bird. It was a funny looking bird called the dodo. And I don't know, maybe you've heard some older person say once that well, it's like the dodo or it's as dead as a dodo, meaning it doesn't even exist anymore. Have you ever heard that? It's been a while since I've heard it. I wonder if there'll be dodo birds in heaven. I mean, I don't know. What about woolly mammoths? Sometimes they find them fossilized and they're kind of like elephants, but they're woolly and they have these great big long tusks. Wouldn't it be interesting if there are mammoths in the new earth? I don't know. I don't know what the sea creatures will be like that we will see, but it's going to be so good. And the Bible says that the lion will lay down with the lamb, meaning that one animal won't attack another. And we can know that an animal won't attack us and we won't have to be afraid of animals and animals won't be afraid of us too. That's sometimes why animals act in an unfriendly way because they're afraid of us. But in heaven, there won't be any of that. The Bible says there'll be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any pain, because the former things are passed away. We have the hope of seeing Jesus when He comes back at the second coming, and He's going to take us to be with Him in heaven. Can you imagine the reunions that are going to take place? You know, there are some people that haven't seen their parents in a very long time. My father died quite a few years ago. Would it be great to be reunited, me and my dad, in heaven? You may be, maybe you'll see grandparents. Oh, well, I'm sure you will. But grandparents who have died that you haven't seen for such a long time, that's very sad. You know something? I never, ever met any of my grandparents. Not a single one. My mother's parents, my father's parents, on both sides, my grandparents, they were all gone by the time I was born. Isn't that a strange thing? So I'm looking forward to maybe meeting my grandparents for the very first time after Jesus comes back. The best thing, of course, is that we'll be with Jesus. We'll be in the presence of God and in the presence of angels. And we'll be able to travel to places we've never been before, to other worlds, to other planets. It's going to be fantastic when Jesus comes back and everything is going to be perfect and nothing will be broken and nothing will be tainted and marred and stained and scarred by sin. It's going to be perfect. What a wonderful thing. We might live in a sinful world now and Jesus says to us, hey, hang on, look beyond this world. Don't be discouraged by what you see. Don't think this is all you have. And might I say, Jesus says, don't become so caught up in this world. Don't get absorbed by this world 
and forget what's really coming. Now, you know how important that is. Here in this earth, people say, hmm, I'd like to have a lot of money. And there's nothing wrong with having a lot of money until money becomes your God, and that's not good. Or I'd like to be famous. Or maybe I'd like to be like the actor that I saw. Or maybe I'd like to be like the musician that I saw. Well, no, I think what you really want to be like is like Jesus and let him guide your life. I think that's what you want. But we can get used to the idea that this world is our home when it's not. Heaven is our home. We are just passing through here on our way to get to there. I want to share a story with you about some young people who understood this. They understood that, that earth was not their home, that heaven was where they were really headed, and that their time on this earth was simply preparation for heaven. In other words, they knew that they were here on this earth to finish strong. They lived long ago, so they won't be uh, living when Jesus comes back, but they'll instead be in that group of people who will be raised from the dead. And I say that with great confidence because the Bible leads us to be confident in their story and in their eternal future. So I'm going to read to you from the book of Daniel. What a great book the book of Daniel is. And when I talk to you about young people in the book of Daniel, I think you might already know who it is that I'm going to talk to you about. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. That's like 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a great and a mighty king, and people were very afraid of him, and whatever he said happened, and he was quite a ruthless man. And they had invaded Israel, attacked Jerusalem, destroyed the place, killed a lot of people, and then brought many people back down to Babylon. It was a journey of 400 miles across the hot desert from Jerusalem to Babylon, and that is today located in the country that we would call Iraq. So they went to Babylon. It was a great and a powerful kingdom. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going to serve me. Now, in the previous chapter, he had a dream that he couldn't remember. And Daniel interpreted the dream. He said, you saw head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thigh of bronze, uh, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And Nebuchadnezzar took that to heart. And he said, yes, yes, your God is a great God. Uh, we'll talk about that some other time, I hope, how the metals represented kingdoms and how God was tracing time from Daniel's day to the end of time. Well, in the next chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar did an inexplicable thing. He made a, a, a big statue out of only gold. No chest and arms of silver, no belly and thighs of brass, no legs of iron, no feet of iron and clay. Whole thing was gold. And this was Nebuchadnezzar saying, my kingdom is not going to pass away. Oh, no, it is not going to pass away. So he set up the statue and he said, all right, everybody come out onto the plain of Dura and worship the statue. Do you think, do you think God's boys out there on the plain of Dura were going to be able to do that? Well, no, they weren't. They weren't idol worshippers. They were worshippers of the true God. And there was no way in the world that they were going to bow down and worship that image. So the king said, when you hear the music, you are to bow down and worship this golden image. Well, this was a problem for the three young men. And their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the Bible says... At the time when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They all did it, except for three young men. And they said to the king, these three boys, these three young men, didn't bow down and worship the image. And King Nebuchadnezzar was flaming mad. He was furious. And he said, you got to do it. And they said to him, you ought to listen to this. They said to him, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, 
we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And then they said something truly remarkable. They said, but if not, Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're still not going to worship that thing because we are worshipers of the one true God. Nebuchadnezzar said, all right, start the music. You got to bow down and worship. The music started and they didn't bow down and worship anything. He was so angry. He should throw them into a burning, fiery furnace. That thing was so hot that the men who threw them in were destroyed by the heat. They were killed by the heat. That's how hot it was. And into that burning, fiery furnace, probably a kiln in which they they made bricks hard, into that thing went Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No Daniel. Daniel was out of town. He wasn't around for this. Probably the king sent him away knowing Daniel would never obey. But the king didn't know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were made out of the same stuff as was Daniel. In they went to the fiery furnace. And I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar thought, what a waste. What a waste of three fine, young, principled men. Young men. Now, they were probably teenagers, older teenagers, who just wouldn't bow down. They could have been of such use to King Nebuchadnezzar in his kingdom. But something happened here. The Bible says the three young men fell down bound because they tied them up into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste. He got up quickly and he spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They said, Yes, true, O king. He said, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of god shadrach meshach and abednego decided that they would stay true they wouldn't turn back they wanted to finish strong this world was not their home they were going to go to heaven when the king said you are to bow down and worship that image. They said, how, how could we? We're servants of God. It sounds to me like Joseph, when Joseph got in a tricky situation, he said, how can I do this? I can't sin against God. There was no way. And when they made a bold stand for God, who stood with them? Jesus was right there in the burning, fiery furnace. You know what that tells me? It tells me that when a young person makes a stand for Jesus, he says, no, no, I can't do that because Jesus lives in my heart. No, I I, I won't participate in that because I'm the servant of the Most High God. When you make that kind of a stand, Jesus stands with you. You see, my friend, we are not keeping our eyes on this earth. We are focused on the world to come. We want to get out of here one day and go home to heaven. This earth is not our home. We want to finish strong. And before we're finished, I'm going to share with you the story of somebody who did not finish strong. And it cost this individual greatly. But we want to finish strong. Jesus is coming back soon. Imagine knowing that and not being ready to meet him. And remember what it takes to be ready to meet Jesus? Inviting Jesus into our heart, asking him to live his life in us, and surrendering our will to him. We say, not my will, your will. Not my plans, your plans. Not my wishes, your wishes. And if you'll read the Bible for even just a moment, you'll learn that God can be trusted and his ways are always the best ways. Okay, but what if, see, when you read in the Bible about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you don't read about them making any mistakes. Undoubtedly, they did. Undoubtedly, they were sinners. But you don't read about any of that. I don't know why. Maybe it's just not important to the story. But we know that all people have sinned. But what about someone who's a rotten old sinner? 
and I mean a rotten old sinner. Is it possible that they can finish strong? Oh, now I want to tell you about somebody who's a little older than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you'll be so encouraged. This person didn't know a whole lot about God, as far as we can tell. Must have known something, but maybe not a whole lot. This person had no history following God. He was an older person. We don't know how old, but he was a grown-up. And he had been an official in the Roman army. So he may have been to war. He may have seen bloodshed. He may have caused bloodshed. He may have. We don't know a lot about him except what we read here in the Bible story. And we read this story in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Now, two men, Paul and Silas, Paul who wrote so many books in the New Testament. He wrote Romans and the Corinthians and he wrote the Timothys and he wrote Titus and we think he wrote Hebrews and he wrote the Thessalonians and he wrote the, all these books. Paul and Silas were in a city called Philippi. Now, Philippi was in, maybe is in, the country today that we call Greece. So it was a nice warm country with lots of really lovely food. And that's where they were and they were serving Jesus. And they were preaching and they were teaching. And the Bible says this, that as they did so, a young woman, she was a slave. She was following them around and making a nuisance of herself. She was crying out, these men are the servants of the Most High God. She was telling the truth, but it was still a nuisance. You know, sometimes the devil will tell the truth. This girl was demon possessed which reminds me of a question we had not long ago. She was demon-possessed. Well, the Bible says she did this for many days, and Paul became annoyed, and he turned, and he said to the demon, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And the demon came out that very hour. I want you to notice something, my friend. That young woman was wake, making a nuisance of herself, and Paul was kind of ticked off about what was happening. He wasn't angry. But he was annoyed, and he would much rather this young woman did not bother them. What did he do? Well, what's interesting is what he did not do. This young woman was making a nuisance of herself, and Paul didn't say to the woman, Hey, you young woman, get out of here. He didn't say, Hey, you young woman, you're driving me mad. No, he didn't do that. Why is that? Because he understood that it wasn't the woman who was the problem. Wait a minute, pastor. The woman's following them around. She's shouting at the top of her lungs. She's creating a scene. Of course, she's the problem. No. See, when someone's treating you wrong, you think mm, you're the problem. Not so. When some terrible thing happens, you might think, oh, you're the problem. Mm, probably not. Paul turned and spoke to the demon. It was the demon causing the problem. And when you know that, you can be a little more gentle with people. Go a little easier on people. It's not the people who's the problem. It's the devil working in those people and messing them up and causing them to act like devils. So be careful who you get angry with. Don't get too angry with people. Don't get angry with people. Instead, if you've got to be miffed about something, get miffed with the devil because the devil is the problem. So he spoke to the demon and said, come out. And the demon came out. And then the people got mad because there were people making money off this young woman because she was a, 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 sort of a fortune teller. Anyway, before long, Paul and Silas found themselves in prison. And it wasn't good. The Bible says that they were whipped when they had laid many stripes on them. Then they threw them into prison and told the jailer to keep them securely. And so the jail keeper, this is the man I spoke to earlier, he would have been once upon a time a servant in the Roman army. I mean, an officer in the Roman army, a soldier. And he put their feet fast in the stocks, that those things that you lock down over their feet so that they couldn't escape. And it was greatly uncomfortable for those men, Paul and Silas. They were serving God and for their trouble, they were thrown in prison. First, they were whipped and beaten, and then they were securely fastened in what was a very uncomfortable situation. How'd they react? Hmm? How'd they react? The Bible says at midnight, their darkest hour, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. 
They didn't get angry. They sang and prayed. They were horribly mistreated, and yet they sang and prayed. Ooh, why? Because the Holy Spirit was moving in that Philippian jail, and God saw that there was a man there who might have been impressionable to the moving of the Holy Spirit. God wanted to save somebody. Yes, Paul and Silas, but there was somebody else that he wanted to save. Well, there was an earthquake, and suddenly everybody's bands fell off, the chains fell off, and they could have run free. And the jail keeper, who had been sleeping, and he shouldn't have been, woke up, and he thought that the prisoners had all escaped. And Paul calls out, and he says, Now, don't do anything rash. We are all here. The jail keeper couldn't believe it. And what did he do? The Bible says he called for a light, ran in, and fell trembling before the feet of Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, that's a great question. And what was the answer? In answer to that question, Paul and Silas said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. The man was astonished. He met Jesus that night. The Bible says he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, washed their wounds. And immediately he and all of his family were baptized. They washed away his sins. So even a hard old sinner like a jail keeper in Philippi can be saved and can finish strong. How is it with your heart? Jesus wants you to finish strong. That jail keeper met Jesus that night, and he was baptized. If you haven't been baptized, I want to encourage you to be baptized and to be baptized soon. Before I talk more about that, let me say this. That old jail keeper, no one would have given him the time of day. No one would have thought that he had a soft heart. No one would have thought that there's any way that man could go to heaven. But God knew and what God needed was somebody to witness and share. And when Paul and Silas found themselves in that prison, a place no one would have wanted to be, they witnessed and they shared. And what happened? What happened was the jail keeper came to faith in Jesus. So here's my question for you. Do you think there's somebody that you could share with who could come to faith in Jesus? Do you think there's somebody in your life, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your school who isn't a follower of Jesus, but through your example and your kind actions and your encouraging words could become a follower of Jesus? I think there is. You know, Jesus a long time ago said the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. He's looking for laborers. And you and I could be laborers together and labor is together with Jesus, encouraging others to know that Jesus is coming back soon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they finished strong out on the plain of Dura. And one day they'll finish strong because Jesus will come back and they'll come out of the grave. And there'll be some less likely people. That old jail keeper who was a hard man, but he met Jesus that night and he gave his heart to Jesus and he was baptized. And we'll see him when Jesus comes back. The jail keeper is going to finish strong as well. Now, are you going to finish strong? If you haven't given your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you to do that. If you haven't been baptized, and if the time is right, then it's time for you to be baptized. And I'm going to ask you just a moment to raise your hand. That's why we pray, not yet, and indicate that you'd like to be baptized. And your teacher or someone there with you will know, and then they'll be able to talk with you about it. And if it's appropriate, arrange for you to be baptized or start some Bible study so you can start getting ready for baptism and you can really get to know Jesus as your best friend and as your savior. Now, I mentioned to you that I would tell you a story about someone who didn't finish strong. And I'm going to tell you the story because I don't want you to be like this person. <laughs> okay. Now, it was 2007. That's 17 years ago before you were born, most likely. In the city of Chicago, it was October and very hot, unusually hot. They were running the Chicago Marathon. That's a running race around the streets of Chicago, 26 miles. Man, that's a long way, but these very fine athletes run those distances. It was so hot that many of the favored runners just dropped out of contention. 
A number of people were taken to the hospital suffering from heat stroke. It was a really rough situation. But one of the ladies in the women's marathon race, she was doing fine. She was a runner from Romania. Her name was Adriana Putia. She was doing so well, she was leading the marathon. It was her first ever marathon. So she'd never won one. And in her first one, it's one of the most famous marathon races. She was going to finish strong and she was going to win the marathon. Wow, you couldn't believe it. So if you watch the video of this, she's running towards the finish line and things are just going so well. There's nobody behind her in the distance. You can't see anything. But here's what happened. As she got near the finish line, she didn't finish strong. Oh, she finished, but not strong. What happened? Well, there's a big crowd and she started to look around and she started to smile. She even started to high five people in the crowd. And then there's this really interesting uh, camera angle. You look at it on the video and they show down the, around the corner, there comes an African runner, Berhane Adere from Ethiopia. We talked about an Ethiopian runner first time, didn't we? Well, here's another Ethiopian runner. And she realizes that way up ahead, there's the woman from Romania just kind of taking it easy and high-fiving the crowd and, hey, what's up? And it's a nice day. The finish line was ahead. She should have blocked out everything else and run like crazy to the finish line. But she didn't. And Bohani Adere said, I might beat her because she's distracted. She's not focusing on the finish line. She's not finishing strong. So Ms. Adere came out wide on the track, maybe so the woman wouldn't hear her footsteps. And she began to sprint like crazy, run like there was no tomorrow, run so fast you couldn't believe it at the end of a 26-mile marathon. Ms. Pertia, meanwhile, oh, she's running, but she's forgotten all about running for that finish line hard. She's high-fiving and waving and having a happy time. And then suddenly she realizes the lady passed her just a few yards from the finish line. She tried to respond, but it was too late. And she didn't win the marathon. She came second by three seconds. She should have won. But the problem was she took her eyes off the goal and she didn't finish strong. What's the goal for us? The goal is Jesus. The goal is being ready for the second coming. The goal is to go to heaven. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Would you like to be with Jesus? You want more than this world has, don't you? Oh, we can get stuff and toys and games and this and that and devices. And some of that's okay until your focus is no longer on Jesus and then none of it's okay. Jesus is coming back soon. He wants you to be ready for that day so much that he came to this earth and died on a cross. He took your sin. They nailed him to a wooden cross. And it was so painful. It was so agonizing. And he was so lonely. And his heart hurt so much. But he did it for you so that one day you could have eternal life and not eternal death. We want to be with Jesus, don't we? Yes, we do. We want to finish strong, and there's no reason we cannot. Why don't we pray, invite Jesus into our lives, and if you haven't been baptized and you'd like to be, raise your hand, and if you've never given your heart to Jesus, raise your hand. We'll do that while we pray. Pray with me now. Bow your head with me. Heavenly Father, we have bowed our heads, our eyes are closed, and we are praying. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what an example. This world was not their home. Don't let us get so comfortable here that we like the earth more than we like heaven. Don't let that happen. And then there was a jail keeper. He lived a terrible life, but he heard about Jesus and he responded. And there are more jail keepers. This shows us that even somebody who has never come to Jesus and has lived a rough life can come to Jesus. And all around us are people just waiting to hear an encouraging word. Let us be that encouraging word. And then, Lord... The lady didn't win the race because she took her eyes off the finish line. She lost her focus. Don't let us do that. We want to commit our lives to Jesus today. 
and we want to focus on being ready for the second coming. And my friend, you can be ready right now by accepting Jesus into your heart and then accepting him every day. Would you like to do that? If you haven't been baptized and you'd like to be, would you raise your hand? And one of the teachers or somebody nearby is going to take a note of that and talk to you about it later and encourage you to follow on with Jesus to be baptized at the right time. It might be for you that you're going to study the Bible a little bit more and understand more of what following Jesus is about. And I would say that's wonderful news. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, even if you don't plan to be baptized right now, but you want to choose Jesus, would you raise your hand right now and say, I choose Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And we'll remember this decision. Tomorrow we'll say, no, I chose Jesus yesterday. And next week we'll say, I chose Jesus last week and I choose him again. And we'll keep on choosing Jesus to be our best friend. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you and following you. Bless these, my friends, who have made decisions for you. And as we have, through finishing strong, considered Jesus and living for him, give us grace to do that now and to finish strong and be ready for the second coming of Jesus, which we know will be soon. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being part of this special time. I wish you God's richest blessing. And I hope to see you one day soon. And I certainly hope to see you when Jesus comes back. And together we can finish strong.